everyone. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to Within the Frame, where we delve deeper into the top stories not only in South Korea, but across the globe. I'm Kim Bo-kyung. It will soon be one year since Russia invaded Ukraine. The West has made the big decision to arm Ukraine with battle tanks, pledges made from many countries, including Germany, United Kingdom, and the United States. As some pundits say, Russia could expedite plans for offensives before the new Western tank deliveries are made. And thus, Ukraine, too, is speeding up talks with Western allies again, calling for long-range missiles and military aircraft. But will battle tanks offer Kyiv a chance to turn the tide? And what are Western nations thinking in cases where they are ruling out Ukraine's requests? And how will this conflict affect South Korea? For an in-depth analysis, we invited Professor Kim Jae-chun, who is also a dean of Sogang Graduate School of International Studies. Professor Kim, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. All right, and we also have John Blexland, Professor in Intelligence Studies and International Security at Australian National University. Professor Blexland, welcome and thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Bokyo. Good to be with you. All right, Professor Kim, first question to you. Lots of media outlets are focusing on a coalition of Western nations having made the decision to supply tanks. Now, why was Ukraine so earnestly asking for battle tanks? Well, um, Ukrainians wanted these tanks since the beginning of the war because they believe that they can win major battlefield victories with uh, more advanced tanks. You know, these German tanks, Le Leopard 2, and also American tanks, M1 Abrams. Uh, these Western tanks are much more advanced than these Russia-made tanks that Ukrainians are using right now. And now the experts are saying that Russians would launch major offensive in, in, in spring, you know, as early as, as March, in which case there is going to be very intensive battles. And in, in order for Ukrainians to prevail in these battles, Ukrainians felt they needed Western tanks. And NATO allies eventually were convinced that Ukrainians stand a, a, a good chance of prevailing in these battles with uh, Western tanks. And uh, it is absolutely necessary uh, for Ukrainians to win these battles in, in the spring because these battles will be very decisive uh, in terms of which side will be uh, coming out as will, will come out as, as the winner uh, from this war in the end. Right. Then, Professor Blixland, what tanks are being sent and how are these models different from each other? So there are three broad models being deployed. One is the Leopard 2, which is uh, Germany's top of the line tank. And the Leopard tank is a tank that costs about $6 million. It can run about 70 kilometers an hour. It uh, has a 120 millimeter smooth bore gun that can fire 42 rounds out to about 6,000 meters with accuracy. It can fire on the move. It can, it can, fire, uh, with, it can fire at night. It can detect uh, targets at night. It is a remarkably capable platform, a crew of four. It is um, about 55 to 62 tonnes. And uh, it's, uh, it's next one along is the, is the Abrams, the M1A2 Abrams, uh, which is slightly uh, heavier and more expensive than the Leopard shown there. Uh, the Leopard is... Uh, you know, it's well, really well regarded because there are so many, particularly in Europe, all of the neighbouring European countries tend to have it. The Poles, the, the, the Baltic states have it. And the Poles, of course, have been training Ukrainians on the use of them so they can deploy them rapidly. They have the advantage also of being uh, easier to maintain. The M1A2 Abrams is a robust, incredibly potent piece of kit, equally uh, capable in terms of its main armament. It has a essentially a jet engine, which means it can move very, very quickly. It's very agile, very responsive, 
but it's very heavy and it's very heavy on the use of, of, of fuel as well. And it uses uh, uh, jet fuel, gas turbine, but it can also use diesel, so it's quite versatile. Um, and uh, it's also a crew of four. It's about 10 tonnes heavier than the Leopard. Um, it's got less range, about 420 kilometres range, as opposed to the Leopard's uh, 550 kilometre range. Uh, and it's uh, more difficult to maintain because it's based on this jet engine uh, model. It uh, it is trickier to operate. It's not as easy for people to work with than the Leopard. Um, now, the, the Challenger is uh, similarly a 120 millimeter gun. It can go similar speed, not quite as fast as a Leopard, about 64 kilometers an hour. It's slightly heavier than the Leopard, not as heavy uh, as the Abrams, at least in some variations. It goes as fast as the Leopard, goes faster than the Abrams at uh, Oh, sorry, a further range. It's um, the 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 speeds are comparable, but the the advantage of the Abrams is it very powerful. It can really quickly move off the target, uh, off the spot from 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 stationary to uh, to sixty kilometres an hour in a matter of seconds. Um, and um, the the Challenger, it's not. It, it's considered ver an excellent tank. It, it's certainly up for the job. But the M1 Abrams is considered slightly more capable. And of course, the, the advantage of the Leopard, the Leopard, as we call it, is that it is just that much more available in Europe and much more familiar to Europeans. So they've, they've trained on it, they're familiar with it. And of course, they're in ready supply across Europe. So Poland, the Baltics, Germany, Netherlands, uh, various countries have, donate, have offered to donate, Norway, Finland, Netherlands, Spain, uh, the, uh, et cetera. So it's really, there are similarities and differences, broadly very similar, uh, but maintenance-wise, they're quite distinct, and that's going to present some challenges for them. Right. There was a brief explanation uh, by Professor Blackson on each model provided by the uh, Western nations. But Professor Gim, uh, Germany actually took uh, quite a long time to uh, make a decision. But why did it take so long for Germany to agree to send tanks? And why did Germany ultimately make such a decision to do so? You're, you're right, Paul Gell. Uh, initially, Germans were hesitant. I, I think you have to understand German strategy. Per chair, you know, Germany is responsible for not just for World War II, but also for World War One to a great extent. And these two great wars brought about disastrous outcomes. And Germans, many Germans feel responsible for these two great wars. So there are strong anti-war sentiments shared by many in Germany, and many Germans still believe that their military policy should be, um, how can I say, minimalistic in, in nature. So there's one reason why Germany was sort of dithering. And also, Germany is heavily reliant on Russian gas. I, I think that was also affected them as well. Sure, Ukrainian war changed Germany's attitude greatly. And then also their security policies, but still sending tanks was a bit too much. But Poland was pushing, was saying, well, if you're not sending Leopard 2, then we'll be sending them to Ukraine. And then Germans were saying, if Americans will send them on Abrams, then we would uh, reconsider. And Americans were finally saying that, well, if that is the case, we'll be sending you know, our Abrams to, to Ukraine, so should you. That, I think, uh, uh, led to German decision to to send uh, Leopard to, uh, to Ukraine. Right. Now, Professor Kim, uh, pledges have been made, but the specific arrival time remains unclear. Now, in order to successfully boost uh, Ukraine's war efforts, when do you believe it would be the most appropriate timing for uh, the tanks to arrive at uh, Ukraine? And if the tanks do get delivered at the appropriate time, could they be a potential game changer in the Ukrainian war? Mm, I, I think they, you know, these tanks have a potential of, you know, to become a game changer. But as you said, it is imperative for these tanks to arrive at proper timing, preferably, preferably before the Russian major offensive, you know, this major Russian offensive begins uh, in spring, many people say. 
So it is imperative for these tanks to arrive before Russian major offensive. One concern is that it may take uh, three or four months for German leopards to arrive. In case of, uh, you know, American Abrams, it may take uh, more than a year. Uh, and another concern is that these, web, you know, Western tanks are, you know, these are these are no toys. So these tanks are state-of-the-art machinery, very complicated and very sophisticated to operationalize, which means that uh, Ukrainian soldiers would have to receive proper training, which will take some time. And since you have new tanks, you might also have to restructure your military organization so that you can use these tanks in an effective manner. And this will, this will also take some time. So basically, uh, in order for these tanks to be better ready, uh, it'll take some time. So I, I think it'd be better if these tanks could arrive as soon as possible, you know, uh, sooner than later. Right, as soon as possible. Now, uh, Professor Blickfeld, apparently Ukraine has asked for the additional creation of a fighter jet coalition along with long-range missiles. Could you elaborate for us why Ukraine is asking such additional uh, high-tech weapons right now? So when we think about combined arms warfare, most modern military practitioners recognize the limitations of various platforms. And I think a, a useful analogy is a bit like the game of rock, paper, and scissors. And if you think about the cap the functions of the rock, the paper, and the scissors, they are complementary, they've got limitations. The tank has limitations, infantry have limitations, and there's a complementarity to having air defense and air cover to operate as part of a combined arms joint team. And this is something which has been very much a shortfall on the Ukrainian armed forces capability options at the moment. So as they look to push the Russians back in the Donbass and potentially in Crimea, uh, air power is, is incredibly important for offensive advanced maneuver. Um, in, in the defensive phase, arguably you can get by with less, uh, but of course, and because you can rely more on air defense artillery and missiles, but when you're looking to advance, you're looking to provide air power over the, over the battlefield as well. Um, and of course, this is very important for balancing out the ability of Russia to use its air power against, against Ukraine. So this is an understandable appeal. And the F-16 is kind of the perfect platform. It's relatively accessible. There are hundreds of them available across Europe this much like the Leopard, the Leopard 2. Um, they are widely used by NATO countries. And uh, this is a piece of kit that would not be all that difficult for Ukrainian pilots to be trained to operate and then uh, fly in operations in and around Ukraine as they continue to try and manage their conflict against, uh, against Russia. An understandable uh, imperative. One of the key things here is there's been a reluctance from the West to give, but we've seen slowly ratcheting up uh, incrementally more willingness to provide more high-tech, high more lethal, more offensive weapon systems. The F-16, the fighter jet, is the next increment up along that way, along with the longer range missile systems that are in demand as well. Right. Uh, Professor uh, Blexman said it was an understandable appeal, but Professor Kim, both German Chancellor and U.S. President Joe Biden, however, ruled out sending fighter jets to Ukraine. Why so? And how will other countries react to Ukraine's continued requests like this? Well, basically, Germany and other NATO allies, you know, they don't really want to be sucked into the war. That's why they were hesitant about sending, you know, these tanks to, to Ukraine in the first place. But eventually they agreed to send them. But now, you know, in case of Germany, uh, you ask me to send these jet fighters. Hey, that's just uh, a bit too much. You know, I, I'm not going to send jet fighters. But uh, as Professor Blacksland said, this might change as well because these NATO countries are saying, well, uh, you need jet fighters, then we can think about them, you know, let, let us think about them. Of course, uh, President Joe Biden said that we're not going to 
send uh, F-16. Uh, but uh, I think NATO allies are being a little bit ambiguous here. It's a strategic ambiguity. Uh, and also, there is a little doubt that NATO allies are, are supporting Ukrainians with all their hearts. But they also have to worry about expanding the war. You know, they have to worry about the possibility of escalating this conflict uh, into World War Three. So that's one of the reasons why they are uh, dithering uh, a little bit here. Right. Interesting. Now, Professor Kim, I'd like to give you another question, actually. As Western allies pledged to uh, give modern battle tanks, how did Russia react to it until now? And what would be its next move? I mean, is there any possibility that Putin might use the nuclear weapons? I don't know, honestly. But, uh, you know, Putin hinted at the possibility of using nuclear weapons uh, several times. So this is not the first time for Putin to to make uh, uh, nuclear threats. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think uh, NATO allies' assessment is that Putin is, uh, is bluffing a little bit here. I think that assessment was behind their decision to, to dispatch, to send uh, Western tanks to, to Ukraine because uh, Russian nuclear threat is, is bluff. Uh, I, I think uh, it's like a, a bit like a chicken game kind of situation now, you know, in the sense that NATO allies, you know, they don't want to expand the war. Uh, neither does Russia. So uh, knowing that, I, I think each side is trying to push the envelope here, trying to test the uh, nerves the, the other. Personally, I don't think Putin will be using nuclear weapons, tactical or or otherwise, because there is just uh, too little to gain and too much to lose. But uh, who knows, really? Uh, you know, if he believes that he's cornered, then there's no way for him to uh, reverse the course. Uh, he may may actually use these uh, tactical nuclear weapons, you know, out of frustration, you know, feed a peak. So uh, if this happens, then this is going to uh, bring about disastrous outcomes. That's for sure. Right. We'll have to have our fingers crossed not to have disastrous outcomes by Putin. Now, uh, Professor Plexland, soon it will have been a readier year since the war broke out. And in the process, a, a lot of experts say the Ukrainian war has resulted in forging a new version of C Cold War. Now, what is this new version of Cold War and how is this likely to unfold in the future? So I have been reluctant to label this a Cold War because during the Cold War, we had a very clearly demarcated, you know, first world, second world with the Warsaw Pact countries, China and Russia, the Soviet Union. They were economically quite distinct. They operated quite separately. That kind of separation doesn't apply or hasn't applied for the last couple of years. Although we are seeing that ratcheting up, but with it, there is still an interdependence uh, we are still seeing considerable trade between Russia and many other countries, including uh, Russia, India and China, but Africa and Latin America as well. And so I find the comparison with, uh, with the Cold War a little bit unhelpful because it puts us into old Cold War thinking. And I think the circumstances we face today are quite different. Uh, we're not facing an ideological challenge. We're not seriously contemplating a threat from communism. Um, what we're dealing with is with an autocracy, a, 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 a dictatorship effectively in, in Russia and to a certain extent a very authoritarian regime in China as well. Um, and the so-called no limits alliance between Russia and China is really more smoke than mir and mirrors than substance. Um, because while uh, while China doesn't want Russia to fail, they're also uncomfortable with the approach that Russia has taken. And they're uncomfortable, I think, with the lessons from Ukraine for China's ambitions with regard to Taiwan. So, yes, there are aspects of this that look like a Cold War, but this is very different. And, and I think we need to think of a new new metaphor, a new model to describe our current predicament. 
Right. Now, uh, Professor Kim, South Korea appears to be taking quite a pragmatic approach to the war in Ukraine based on the law preventing weapons exports for anything other than peaceful purposes. And meanwhile, NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg visited South Korea recently and urged South Korea, too, to allow direct arms exports to Ukraine. I wonder what should South Korea do and how is this new Cold War, though, Professor Blackfen said that there might be, uh, there could be a different word describing it. How is it going to affect South Korea? Yeah, a uh, new Cold War could be a bit of a, a misnomer. Uh, let, let it be uh, escalating rivalry between the U.S. and, and China. Uh, what should South Korea do? I, I think it is in South Korea's interests to stay united with like-minded countries like uh, NATO allies, you know, like-minded countries that have great stakes in, in, in maintaining uh, what they call rules-based liberal international order, which is in jeopardy uh, because of revisionist countries such as Russia and North Korea and China, you know, to a certain extent, to a great extent, to be honest with you. I, I mean, these revisionist countries are, are really happy with the uh, existing rules-based international order. That's the reason why they want to rewrite the order to their liking by using brute force, by invading other, you know, neighboring sovereign country. But think about how South Korea has prospered in the past. You know, I think South Korea has prospered under the rules-based liberal international order. When rules-based liberal international order has been intact, South Korea was able to prosper. So for South Korea to continually prosper, I think it is imperative for South Korea to cooperate uh, with like-minded countries uh, such as uh, NATO allies and, and also uh, Japan. And I, I think it is imperative for South Korea to play a, a proactive role uh, to, to uphold and strengthen uh, rules-based liberal international order. I, I think that's how we'll have to position ourselves in, in this uh, era of escalating rivalry between the United States and, and China. Right. Pro uh, cooperating with like-minded countries would be the best way South Korea to prosper uh, continuously. All right. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's edition. But thank you, Professor Kim and Professor Blexland, for your insights. We really appreciate them. Thank you, Bokyo. Thank you very much. All right. That's all for Within the Frame tonight. Have a great Tuesday. We will be back tomorrow with more in-depth stories on the issues happening in South Korea and, of course, around the globe. Thank you for watching and goodbye.